Welcome, everybody. This is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman. And now we're going to conclude the topic of pawn structures with a nice six part video series on the topic of uh, Carlsbad structures. Let me show you first of all what is a Carlsbad structure. It was t4, t5, c4, e6. It usually happens from a queen's gambit e6, knight c3, knight of 6, bishop g5 c6, e3, knight d7, cd, ed, bishop d3, bishop e7, knight f3, castles, queen c2. So here we get the structure where basically the pawn on d5, the pawn on c4 gets exchanged for the pawn on e6, and then we get a structure where black has a pawn chain like this, and white has a pawn chain f2 to d4, while black has a pawn chain b7 to d5, and um, basically the c pawn is missing and the e pawn is missing. So that sets up some interesting dynamic. The pawn structure is unbalanced, which gives both sides to practically play for a win, because the structure is very unbalanced. So a queen c2, rook e8. Castles. In the game, knight f8 was played. Now, let me show you guys quickly what happens if black tries to play naively here. So, if black tries to play h6, white can play a strong move bishop f4 here. And now the idea is if now knight f8, then h3, and you're able to, for now, try to keep the bishop or trade it only for this bishop and keep this bishop on c8 kind of out of play. As we're starting to notice, the bishop on c8, the light square bishop, is a problem for black in many different openings. So, Basically, we have a situation where black can try to play a tricky move, knight h5. And the idea is to try to get the bishop pair. So let me ask you guys, what do you guys think about this move? And what do you guys think white should play if black plays that move? Well, in fact, this move is a well-known mistake because white has a very nice tactical shot. Knight takes d5. And of course, the idea is if cd, then bishop c7 traps the queen. And if knight takes a 4, knight takes a 4, capturing the knight back, and white's just up a clear pawn. And uh, I actually beat a very strong fide master like this in a rapid game. So there are even some good players who are not aware of this idea. Not to mention that also have to keep in mind that I think this was a classical game. I don't remember who exactly played, but it's a well-known idea. So that's why normally black plays knight f8. Just getting the knight out of the way right away. And now this is the tabia position. And here there are many moves, but the main move is rook a b1. And this is the move we're going to be focusing on in this video. And uh, after rook a b1, black has many moves. So we're going to take a look at them a little bit one by one. What can black play here? Well, white's plan is first of all clear. He's playing rook b1 because he wants to play b4 b5. This is called the minority attack. So he wants to get the pawn to b5 and then try to take on c6 and try to create a weakness for black. That's the purpose of playing this system. And black has to do something about it. And the plan is pretty straightforward for white. So it's, it would seem that it's easier for white to play than for black. Although as we'll see later on in some other videos from the black side, it's not necessarily that true. So in the game, a5 wasn't played. A5, I think, is one of the most testing moves. And let's say after A3, knight g6, but we'll get to that in another video. In the game, knight g6 was played right away, which is a technically a playable move. And now white played the strong move before, logically following up. And now probably black should actually play A6. Because now after A4, knight e4 is possible, and also bishop d6, with the idea that if b5, you can take, take, h6, and you get rid of potentially one of the weakness, and you open this file. And this is actually is still complicated, which is still playable for both sides. But bishop d6 was played right away, and after b5, black did not play h6. He at least should have tried to get this bishop. And then the game would still be not so clear, because even though White's gonna take on c6 and attack this weakness. Black's gonna have some counterplay because he has a pretty decent queen right here. But in this game, Kerr, who is almost a world champion player, is a famous player. He just played bishop d7, a relatively passive move. And uh, 
This is something you have to keep in mind. Whenever opponent has a relatively easy straightforward plan and uh, he's gonna make some of your pawns weak and your pawn structure might be destroyed a little bit, you have to keep in mind that you have to make sure you're able to create some counterplay. And if you don't create counterplay, this game shows what will happen then. So BC, uh, his idea was he wanted to take with the bishop, which is also probably not the best move, because now what happens is, even though black does not have the weak c6 pawn backward pawn, but now the d5 pawn is weak. It's an isolated pawn, and it really, unlike an isolated pawn positions which we saw earlier in the videos, here there's real no compensation for the isolated pawn. There's no attack. And uh, white in the meantime has a very compact pawn structure. So black has basically more pawn islands than white and uh, well white's clearly better. So now after queen b3 white already putting a lot of pressure on this weak d5 pawn. Black had to retreat. And now white made a strong move bishop takes f6. Because if bishop b5, knight d7 takes takes and black's still holding. So that's why bishop takes f6 was played and bishop b5, and now this bishop is slightly misplaced. Queen d6 was played, rook fc1, h5, knight e2, h4, takes, takes, and now the c6 pawn will become weak, queen a4, knight e7, and now perhaps queen a6 was best, not allowing any counterplay, just stopping any kind of a5 idea, and then going rook b7, but Smyslov played rook b7, a5, h3, rook b8, rook b1, takes takes c5 a little bit of counterplay now rook b5 takes takes and okay white's still better and because of black having some weaknesses and the counterplay falls a little bit short for black and eventually slowly but surely white consolidates his advantage and okay now he's two pawns up and then he wins the game black resigned here so this game shows basically in a basic way how white's supposed to play if black does not create counterplay. Now here's another game I wanted to show you. That's a game between two, maybe not the most famous players, but still, Krogers is a well-known master. He helped, I think, maybe Karpo for, if I'm not mistaken. And Ravinsky is also a Russian master. So it's back in 1957. Krogers is white. Started with c4, but it transposed into this typical Queen's Gambit position. Knight f3, knight f8, castle c6, rook a b1, a5, a3. And here black played bishop g4, which again, maybe not the best move. Knight g6 is probably more accurate than the Kasparov played like this. Bishop d6, a b a b, bishop g4. And now the bishop is well placed here, you know, thinking about creating counterplay. And again, counterplay. And this game was later on drawn between Kramnik and Kasparov in a rapid game. So that's what Black should have done. Again, Black has to search for ways to create counterplay, not just sit there. Instead, bishop g4, which looks like a reasonable plan because it's a bad bishop and you want to trade it off. But it turns out it's not um, the most effective plan because it just takes a little bit too long and White's able to execute the minority attack before Black really gets any kind of a attacking chances or counterplay chances. So. Plan looks reasonable, but it's a little slow. Knight e5, bishop h5. And now f4 was interesting, I guess, with the idea of um, trying to not allow bishop g6 so easily. But in the game, b4 was played. Takes, takes. Knight g4. So the idea is logical. Black's trying to trade off some pieces, but the problem is now he doesn't even get rid of this potentially not great piece. And now white's play is just easy. And Clearly, black's counterplay is just too late. And black has this backward pawn. If there is no counterplay, this pawn is just going to be a weakness, right? So rook d6, knight g3. And again, the knight e2, knight g3 is a typical maneuver because white's trying to attack this pawn with the heavy pieces. While the knight is usually doing a good job trying to defend against black's potential counterplay. So knight g3, queen g5. At this point, black is trying, but... As they say, day late, a dollar short. White trades the bishop, which defends now the c6 pawn. It's an important piece now. Takes, queen takes, queen d8, rook b1, rook f6, queen c2, queen d6, queen a4, rook g6, queen b4. Trying to trade queens as well. Queen e6, rook b8, knight d7, 
takes takes queen b7 and now as you see white's really dominating the whole game rook e6 rook a1 now and then rook a8 and now white's getting transforming his advantage to a big positional advantage and that's soon going to become a material advantage so here he induced g5 because he wants to go there so and then he goes back because now he has the f5 square so now it's really tough for black black played f6 knight f5 h5 trying to get some space but h3 g4 again there's not much black could do here g4 takes takes king h2 king f7 king g3 king g6 knight h4 and white won black resigned The next game I wanted to show you is a game between Karpov and Ljubovic. And uh, Karpov was, of course, a great expert on how to play these slight advantages. And uh, he played another strong grandmaster, Ljubovic, but not quite at Karpov's level. And this game is a typical example of how Karpov would outplay slightly lower rated GMs. And again, we have a Queen's Gambit declined, Rook b1. And again, and here black decided to just play knight e4, traditional method, and try to simplify the game. And let's see how white plays here, takes, takes, and simply b4. He ignores this knight, because if he takes, it's not so easy, because knight d2, he's going to play f5. So, and then um, black's going to have the strong pawn on e4. So therefore, white plays just b4, continuing with his minority attack, a6. It's fine. A4, knight a4 was also interesting. Always interesting when they play a6 to go knight c5. And b6 is not going to be easy to play either. So a4 was played. Bishop f5, knight e5. And now I think f6 should have been played. But uh, rook a d8 was a bit too slow. And after rook c1, knight g6. Trying to trade off some pieces, but falls a little short because white gets his b5 in anyway and um, again heavy pieces are good enough to attack this weakness and uh, black simply is out of counterplay now without the minor pieces so basically black's supposed to keep some minor pieces on the board otherwise it's going to be always a suffering endgame takes takes rook d6 of course if black plays rook c8 white's gonna take twice and then take takes again and then go there and then win this pawn and then Okay, eventually he's going to be winning because he has two rooks for the queen. Not to, Two rooks are better than the queen anyway, plus have a pawn, plus a passed pawn, so lost. So he played rook d6, ba, and regardless of how he captures back, this pawn is going to be isolated, weak. And yeah, sure, it's a passed pawn, but right now it's not going anywhere yet, so it's more like a weakness. Queen a4, queen d7, he traded queens. He just simply went to the rook endgame because he saw that this pawn is so weak that it ties down black's rooks basically and that would mean in a position in the rook endgame rook activity is very important and you see how long it took for the king to finally kick out this rook on from b6 but white just returns and after rook b7 finally trying to get some counterplay rook c5 king b8 rook a2 again black's still nowhere near doing anything and in the meantime this e4 pawn is also going to be weak and little by little, white just converts the advantage. And notice how rook takes h4 is bad because of king g3 and then a6 pawn is going to be lost. And then white's going to have actually an attack with two rooks. So uh, because of that a5, rook takes, king b7 somehow, rook here. Okay, he, he decided to do it this way. But now... This rook is going to be traded and uh, okay, he won this pawn and the rest is easy. He just resigned because he's going to lose another pawn shortly. And uh, okay, this is completely lost to rook endgame. So as you could see, sometimes you can even trade off all the pieces. Basically trading off of the minor pieces in the Carlsbad structure for white very often makes a lot of sense because this pawn weakness is going to let itself known. And the best way to attack it is with heavy pieces. And uh, the pawn weakness means that White's pieces will be very active while Black's pieces will be defending and uh, again, it's tough for Black to play a game like that.
And one more game I wanted to show you in this video, in this introductory video, is uh, the game between um, Geller and Mikines. And okay, it started like this, but uh, got to the same Carlsbad structure. So as you can see, the Carlsbad structure can actually arise from several different move orders sometimes. Knight f8, and we got the same thing. And now bishop g4 was played right away. So let's see what happened here. Knight e5, bishop h5, b4. And uh, black tried to trade off like this. Like this, b5. And again, black wasn't able to play a6, which would get rid of the weakness potentially on a7. So bishop g6. Again, cb would allow this pawn to be weak right here. So bishop g6 takes, queen takes was played. And now bishop takes g6 would be the best move. And after knight takes rook b5, instead he played rook c1. Now rook c8 should be played, but knight d7. And now rook b5 and white gets a big advantage. Consolidating everything on this side. And then slowly but surely crashing through. And again, because of this weakness, Black had to desperately try to create counterplay. And also white has all this control on the C file. And uh, remember, this pawn is still weak. Okay, the A7 pawn. And yeah, basically white won very easily from here on. So this is a very introductory video. You know that we just looked at some of the basic ideas. I mean, I can show you one more game between Jabava and Gurevich. And here again, we got the similar idea. And of course, if you play like this with white, you have to count that black can play DC, sharp botanic variation, and h6. But okay, at that time, maybe it wasn't as popular, and Gurevich is a classical player. So he just played a solid system. And here, he just played bishop e6 in a solid way. He's not trying to force anything, he's just playing solidly. So let's see how Jabava plays it. And again, a6 should probably be played, but rook c8. Knight a4. So notice here that b5 is not quite good because cb and then there's pressure on the c file. Not to mention b5 can be meant by c5 right away. So here Jabava just played knight a4. And again, b6 would be creating a weakness on c6. So black doesn't want to do that. He played knight e4. Takes, takes, knight c5. And here the idea was to get the knight to c5. And now he's continuing his maneuver attack. Now Bishop g4 probably should have been played, and with the idea of knight e5, bishop h5, with the idea of f6, and black maybe is close to equal. But black played g6, and again, too slow. Not enough counterplay, just too passive, and white is able to, just in time, play b5. And even though the knight gets to c4, which we'll later see that's one of the main ideas for black, white got in what he wanted. And the c6 pawn is still weak. And, uh, okay, these knights got traded. And again, this target became weak. And, uh, again, the queen endgame is going to be tough because black's going to have to defend a7. So that's why in a lot of lines you have to play a6 as black. Because then you only have to deal with one weakness. But now you have to deal with two weaknesses. And that's very tough. Because of that, white was able to keep both heavy pieces on the board. And now black has to deal with heavy pressure and and eventually he won the spawn and he won the game later on. So this is just an introductory. This just shows some basic plans for white. Very conventional plans, which a lot of you probably already know. But in case some don't, this is just a nice introductory video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And until next time, this is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman signing off. We're going to be looking at some more interesting ideas for white and the Carlsbad structures. Take care, everybody.